Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. Hayya ala as-salah Hayya ala as-salah Hayya ala al-falah Hayya ala al-falah Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar La ilaha illa Allah إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam There are many profound verses in the Quran that describe various scenes from the hereafter essentially giving us snapshots at what awaits us as we transition from this life to the next life. This will give us an opportunity to make adequate preparation for this journey. One of the most powerful passages in the Quran that captures the two extremes that every Muslim lives their life in between and that is al-khawf wal-raja, fear and hope. Our entire lives fluctuate between fear and hope. There's not a day that we wake up, there's not a moment in our lives except that we are in between one of those two extremes, either extremely fearful, what's to, what, what, what awaits us on the other side, what if, what if Allah doesn't forgive me, what if Allah punishes me, how do I answer for those sins, how do I respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's not a moment in our lives where those thoughts don't cross our minds. And then there's the hope. That alhamdulillah, I'm Muslim. Alhamdulillah, I'm on la ilaha illallah. Alhamdulillah, I'm, uh, you know, my family is Muslim. Alhamdulillah, my children are Muslim. These are things that give us hope. Alhamdulillah, I make five salat a day. Alhamdulillah, I fast the month of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, I do my best. Allah knows that I'm trying my best. So there is not a moment in our lives except that we fluctuate in between these two extremes, either between fear and hope. Both of which motivating, fa- both of which are motivating factors, fueling our drive and our endurance and our tolerance with the challenges that we face in this life. The verses that I'm referring to are the verses that are found in the last ayats of Surah to Zumar, Surah number 39 in the Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says as He begins these passages, 
in this last surah or uh, the last section of Surah to Zumar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ نُفِخَ فِيهِ أُخْرَى فَإِذَا هُنْ قِيَامُ يَنْظُرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ And when the trumpet is blown, this will end everything. وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ When the trumpet is blown, فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ الله. And everyone on the heavens, everything and everyone in the heavens and on earth will die immediately after hearing this sound. Everyone will die. Sa'iqa man fi samawati wa man fi al-ard illa man sha'a Allah. Then Allah gives a istithna, an exception. There will be some exceptions. The scholars say that the exception to this dying will be Angel Jibreel and Angel Mikael and Angel Israfil. And some of the scholars add to that that maybe it's the shuhada, those martyrs, those who died fighting fi sabilillah, who are already in Jannah. Because death will only come to those who are on earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that everyone on the heavens and the earth will perish except those whom Allah wills. The scholars that say that Angel Jibreel, Angel Mikael, and Angel Israfil are ex exception to that uh, is because Angel Israfil himself is going to be the one to blow the trumpet. As a matter of fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him to blow the trumpet. He has been having his mouth up to the trumpet, waiting for the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to blow from the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in the hadith, in the taraf sahib al-sur, mundhu wukila bihi musta'iddun yandhru nahwa al-arsh makhafatan an yu'mar qabla an yartadda ilayhi tarafuhu ka anna aynayhi kawkabani dariyani. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in an authentic hadith that the eye of the, the angel that is going to blow the trumpet and that angel is Angel Israfil. His eyes from the day that he was created has been staring at the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala waiting for the commandment to blow the trumpet. And he is afraid that he will blink his eye. He's not even going to blink his eye because he's afraid that if he blinks his eye within the moment that it takes him to blink his eye, that Allah will command him to blow the trumpet and he will not respond immediately. So this angel, from the moment Allah created him, has had his eyes open, staring at the throne of Allah, waiting for the command. He never blinks his eye out of fear that he might miss the command. Out of fear that he might not respond immediately soon as Allah commands him. Subhanallah. And the scholars, they explain that this trumpet is so huge that the mouth part of the trumpet is slim and it gets wider as it, gets, as it comes out. And the outer part of the trumpet is enough to fit everything in the galaxy within it plus seven more added to it. That's how huge the trumpet is. So one blow from this trumpet, everyone will hear this noise and immediately die. Everyone will hear this noise and immediately die, with the exception, as Allah mentions, إِلَّا مِنْ شَاءَ Allah, Except those whom Allah wills. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ نُفِخَ فِيهِ أُخْرَى فَإِذَا هُمْ قِيَامُ يَنْظُرُونَ And then the angel will blow the trumpet again for a second time. A second time. And everyone that is dead will be resurrected and brought back to life. Everyone that is dead will be brought back to life. And these are the final two blowings of the trumpet. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in another ayah in the Quran, وَنُفِخَ فِي السُّورِ فَفَزِعَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ وَكُلٌّ آتَوْهُ دَاخِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in another ayah, and then the trumpet will be blown, and everyone in the heavens and the earth will die, except those whom Allah wills, and then they will all come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dakhirin. Then Allah mentions, إِنَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah is aware of everything that you've done. وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَاتِ فَلَهُ خَيْرٌ مِنْهَا وَهُمْ مِنْ فَزِعٍ يَوْمَئِذٍ آمِنُونَ And whoever did good deeds in the life of this world, وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَاتِ Whoever comes in the next life, comes in the next world with hasanat, with good deeds. 
He will be given khayr minha. He will be given as a compensation, as a reward for those good deeds many times over. He will be rewarded many times over. You will be given more than what you deserved, even for the smallest little good that you did. وَهُمْ مِنْ فَزَعِنْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ آمِنُونَ And they will have no fear on the day when everybody else is resurrected. They will have no fear. Those who did good deeds have no fear. It's like going to the doctor for a checkup and you have no fear because you know, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't have illicit sex or sexual relations with anybody. I'm good. I'm just going for a checkup. Unlike people who engage in certain behaviors, engage in certain lifestyles, you go to the doctor, you in fear that they're going to come back with some information that you are not ready to hear. The trembling, the trepidation that you are feeling because you know that you are living a lifestyle and now you have to go to the doctor and possibly have a doctor come back and tell you something that you're not ready to hear. But the person who lives their lives right, in right, in line with God, they have nothing to fear. The blowing of this trumpet will reveal the true reality of this world that we so fell in love with. We are in love with this world that is around us. The Prophet ﷺ uh, was detached from this world. Umar who walked in the Prophet ﷺ's bedroom one day. And he saw the Prophet ﷺ sit up and he could see the straw mat that the Prophet used to lay on on the floor. Lines from the straw mat. On the Prophet Sallallahu face. You know how you lay on something and then you wake up and there's a mark on your face? The Prophet Sallallahu is laying on the floor on a straw mat. And when he sat up, Omar could see the marks from the straw, the imprint of the straw mat on the face of the Prophet Sallallahu And Omar, he started crying. He said, oh, messenger of Allah. Wallahi, why don't we call on Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? I've seen, you know, you have Kisra and Kisra, you have uh, Caesar and you have Heraclius and you have all of these kings of the world, the king of the P Roman Empire, king of the, the Persian Empire. They sit on thrones and crested with rubies and diamonds and pearls. And here you are, the messenger of Allah, laying on a straw mat on the floor. Why don't we call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you some of the riches of the world? The Prophet ﷺ looked at Umar and he said, Ya Umar, Mali wali dunyakum. What do I have to do with your world? This is your world. I'm, not, I'm just passing through. I'm just here to do a job and I leave. I'm not attached to this world. This is your world. What Mali wali dunyakum? What do I have to do with your world? This is your world. This is the world that you are attached to. I'm just a passerby. I'm just passing through. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Kun fi dunya. Be in this world as if you are a traveler. Just a passerby. Somebody who's just passing through. Not to have any attachments. You take all of your things with you on your back. Traveling lightly. Because you realize that everything that we acquire in this world you can't take with you. Your Jordans, your Gucci, your Fendi, your all of this, your car, your Mercedes Benz. And all of these material luxuries that we have so much attachment to. It means nothing when your soul is about to depart from your body. Your polo, your this, your that. All of that means nothing. All of these things that we put so much emphasis on. At that very moment when your soul is getting ready to depart from your body, none of that means anything. So the Prophet said, Mali wali ya Umar. What do I have to do with your world? This is your world. So the blowing of the trumpet will reveal the true reality of this world because none of this will mean anything. When we hear that sound, as, the Prophet, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that a pregnant woman will drop her load without even having the child finish the development, that if a woman is pregnant, when she hears this sound, she will spit out her load. And you will see people running frantically you will see people running frantically as if they are in a drunken state. Well, But they will not be uh, drunk. But the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is severe. And everybody knows what it means. Everybody will know what it means. So the blowing of this trumpet will reveal the true reality of this world that we fell so deeply in love with. It will transform everything that was hidden it will transform everything that was hidden into a reality. It will unmask the world for what it is. The veil of the physical world will be removed and everyone is brought back to life 
They will recognize one another from their previous relationships and engagements in this world. However, we will care nothing about one another. As we are resurrected, we will recognize faces. We will recognize people that we've had interactions with in the life of this world. But in that moment, those interactions will mean nothing. Those engagements will mean absolutely nothing in that moment. But the manner in which we will be standing next to one another will garner so much fear and anxiety and worry, the like of which we have never experienced before. If you have ever been worried before in your life, if you have ever experienced fear in your life, if you have ever experienced anxiety in your life, you will know nothing like the anxiety, the fear, the trepidation, the worry that awaits you when you're standing waiting for judgment. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, when she heard the Prophet Sallallahu say, يُحْشَرُ النَّاسُ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَ حُفَاتٍ عُرَاتٍ غُرْلًا The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, people be, will be resurrected on the day of judgment, naked, barefoot, and uncircumcised. Aisha heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi say this, and she said, يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ الرِّجَالُ وَالنِّسَاءِ جَمِيعًا يَنْظُرُ بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَى بَعْضُ Aisha said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, are you saying that men and women will be standing next to each other, naked, barefoot, uncircumcised, standing next to one another, looking at each other? This is the modesty of Aisha. She couldn't fathom. This is a woman who, when Umar was buried next to the Prophet Wasallam and Abu Bakr in her room, in her house, which is where the Prophet Wasallam died, Aisha said that I used to go in my room to go visit my father and visit my husband, and I would not wear a hijab. Because that's my father, that's my husband. She said, but when Omar was buried in my house, I never went in that room again except that I had on my hijab because of Omar being buried there. This is a, the modesty and the shyness of a woman who is shy and modest in front of a man who's already deceased. This is the modesty and shyness of Aisha. So you can imagine what she thought when she heard the Prophet Sallallahu say that men and women will be naked and uncircumcised, standing next to each other. Aisha said, will they be looking at each other? And the Prophet Sallallahu said to Aisha, Ya Aisha, Al-Amru Ashaddu Min and Yuhummuhum Thadik. He said, Oh Aisha, they, the affair will be so much more severe that they will not even be thinking about that. Can you imagine you standing, right now, you standing next to a woman in line. She has on perfume. You ain't even look at her. You can smell her perfume in front of her, in front of you. She has your attention. Can you imagine a situation that is so dreadful, a situation that is so frightful that you will be standing naked next to somebody from the opposite sex and you will not even be thinking about her. And she will not even be thinking about you. In this life, we can't take our eyes off of one another. But in the hereafter, the person will be naked in front of you, uh, on, by the side of you, and you won't even think anything about it. That's how much fear that people will be in. So the Prophet Sallallahu had to correct Aisha. He said, Aisha, al-amru ashaddu min an yuhummuhum thadik. The affair will be much more severe than what you think, Aisha, that people will not even be thinking about that. And then he quoted the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, minhum yugni. Every soul on that day will have enough worry of its own to be worrying about somebody else. Maybe this is the only time that we will take our eyes off of what other people are doing and focus on what we're doing. That's the only time. Every other time in this life, we're always worried about what somebody else got, what somebody else has. This person has more than me. This person looks better than me. This person's prettier than me. This person's wealthier than me. Always worrying about what somebody else has. On the day of judgment, you will have enough worry of your own to be worried about what somebody else is doing. Maybe that's the only time when we will focus on ourselves. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Al-amr ahamu min an yanzuru ba'dhu min al-ba'd." In the hadith collected in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said to Aisha, "Oh Aisha, the affair will be much more severe than they would the, for them to be looking at one another." And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in another ayah in the Quran, "Kama badatna awwal khalq nuid nuidu wa'adin alina inna kunna fa'ilin." That we, just as we created you the first time, that's exactly how we will bring you back to life. We will bring you back just like we created you the first time. And there will be no kinship. 
No friendship. Father will see his son. Mother will see her daughter. Daughter will see her father. Uh, son will see his mother. And nobody will care about anyone because on that day there will be no kinship. No ties of kinship. No sibling. Oh, that's my brother over there. Nobody will be worried about that. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَإِذَا نُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ فَلَا أَنْسَابَ بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ وَلَا يَتَسَاءَلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and when the horn is blown, when the trumpet is blown, فَلَا أَنْسَابَ بَيْنَهُمْ There will be no ties of kinship between them at that moment. وَلَا يَتَسَاءَلُونَ Nor will anybody ask about anybody else. No one will say, how is so-and-so doing? Is so-and-so okay? Is so-and-so alright? Nobody will ask about anybody else. There will be no father and son. There will be no mother and daughter. There will be no brother and sister. There will be no brother and brother. There will be no sister and sister. No kinship whatsoever on that day because everybody will be worried and concerned about themselves. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَشْرَقَتِ الْأَرْضُ بِنُورِ رَبِّهَا وَوُضِعَ الْكِتَابُ وَجِيءَ بِالنَّبِيِّينَ وَالشُّهَدَاء وَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْنَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and then once they are resurrected, And the flat plain that everybody will be standing on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring the sun, and the sun will glow and shine and illuminate with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not the light of the light in this world that the sun burns with. It will burn with a different light. The light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is because Allah brings the sun in order to shine it on the creation so that when Allah calls you out in front of everybody, you're standing directly in the light in front of everyone. SubhanAllah. It's like someone, we all standing in the dark and Allah brings a bright light and tell you, come here, stand here in the light in front of everyone so everybody can see you. Everybody can see you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَشْرَقَتِ الْأَرْضُ بِنُورِ رَبِّهَا And the earth will be, the flat plain that everybody will be standing on will be illuminated with the light of its Lord. وَوُضِعَ الْكِتَابِ And the books will be brought out. These are the books that are written in it, everything that you did in this life. All of your books will be laid out in front of you. وَجِيَ بِالنَّبِيِّينَ وَالشُّهَدَى And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring out the prophets and messengers and the shuhada, and the witnesses. And some of the scholars say that the witnesses here will be the malaika, al kataba those angels that wrote down all of your deeds. It's like when you go to court, you get a ticket from the police. The police pull you over, they give you a ticket. They give you a summons. You have to show up to court. When you show up to court, you got your, your summons with you, the judge comes out, and he pulls out your whole entire record. Anything that you did in the past, and the police officer, the witness, the police officer that pulled you over and wrote you the ticket. There to verify everything. Because if you deny anything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to simply turn to his angels and say, did, did, did you wrong him in this? Obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need to do any of that because Allah is al-alim, al-hakim. Allah is al-wise. He's the wise and he is the most knowledgeable. Al-khabir bima ta'manun. Allah is well aware of everything that you've done in your entire life. But he brings this as proof against us. Hujjah ala nafsik. That the human being will be a proof against his own self. Allah doesn't need to bring any witnesses. One of Allah's names is as shaheed Allah is the witness. Allah doesn't need witnesses. But he does that so that we have no argument on the day of judgment. We have no argument. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجِيَ بِالنَّبِيِّينَ وَالشُّهَدَاء And the books will be laid out. The prophets and messengers will be brought forth. And the witnesses, the angels who wrote down everything in your book, وَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ And they will be judged in truth. وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And they will not be wronged in the least. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not charge you for something that you didn't do. Allah will not hold you accountable for something that you didn't do. The angels did not write down anything that you didn't do or didn't say. Everything that is in your book, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell the human being, as he mentions in another ayat, read your own book. Iqra' kitabaka. Kafa bi nafsika al-yawma alika hasiba. Read your book. Today you are proof against your own self. Read your book. This is your book. You did this. Did you not? 
Did you not do this at 18 years old? Did you not do that at 20 years old? Did you not do that at 30 years old? Did you not do that at 40 years old? Did you not do that at 50 years old? Everything written down. Read your book. You are a proof against your own self today. And the book of deeds will be laid in front of mankind. And every soul will remember when that book is put in front of you, everybody will remember everything that they did. You don't have to read your book. You already know what you did. You already know exactly what you did. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Fajr, on a day when a human being, when man will remember everything that he did. But how will that remembrance how will that remembrance benefit him? To remember on that day everything that you did, that would be asinine. It's no benefit. What benefit can come to you now that you remember everything that you did that was wrong? On that day, every human being will remember what they did, but how will that remembrance benefit him? And what is recorded in this book, we will be amazed at the precision of the angels in writing down every little detail of our lives. Even some scholars like Imam Ahmed said, even to kahkaha, even your cough, the angels write it down in your book. Even when you go, <coughs> the angels write that down in your book. Blinking your eye, the angels write that down in your book. Every little detail of your life, when we read the book, we will be amazed at the precision of the book. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الكتاب, And the book will be laid in front of them. And you will see the mujrimun, the criminals, those who engage in criminal activity and disobedience to Allah, spent your whole entire life disobeying God, doing you, living your best life. Mushfiqina min mafi, afraid to even open it. You don't even want to open it. Wawudi al kitab, the book will be laid in front of them. وَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ مُشْفِقِينَ مِمَّا فِي And those who live the life of disobedience to Allah will be too afraid to even open it. Afraid because they know what's in it. وَيَقُولُونَ يَا وَيْلَتَنَا مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا And they will say, what is this book? What is with this book? It has recorded every sagira wa kabira, every minor detail and every major detail is recorded in this book. Well, what you do, my amilu hadira, and they will find everything that they did in it. And your Lord will not oppress anyone. Though your Lord will not oppress anyone. The prophets will be brought forth as witnesses over their respective nations. And the Prophet Sallallahu will be a witness over our Ummah. You still have Muslims, unfortunately, especially within the African American Muslim experience. You have Muslims that still place attachments on individuals, on personalities. I will Allah for the life of me, I can't understand why we have such an attachment to personalities, individuals, shaksiyat. So Elijah Muhammad. Or, you know, Master Fard Muhammad. Or, uh, Warf Deen Muhammad. We have so much attachments. Imam Warf Deen. Your Imam should be Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the only Muhammad that you're going to be asked about on the day of judgment. Allah's not going to ask you about how, how, to what detail did you follow Warf Deen Muhammad. With all respect, with all due respect to Warf Deen Muhammad. He was a, he was a man from amongst the many men that if they contributed any good to the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then alhamdulillah, that will be in their scale, yawm al-qiyamah. But he is not the Imam for all Muslims. The only Imam for all Muslims is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Allah says in the Qur'an, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an, brothers and sisters, I want you to listen. Wallah, they must say this with nothing but the utmost respect to our elders, 
But wallah al if we are ever going to succeed as a ummah, as a nation, as a community of believers, we have to disassociate ourselves from these type of attachments that place a barrier between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't care what Elijah Muhammad ever did in his entire life, nothing of what he did can amount to a handful of what the Sahaba did, much less the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu said that when my companions are mentioned, either dhukira ashabi fa'amsiku, when my companions' names are mentioned, don't ever make mockery of my companions. Don't ever make mockery of my companions. Then withhold your tongue from speaking evil about my companions. He said, because walladhi nafsi bi yadi, I swear by the one in whose hands my soul is in, that if one of you was to spend the whole mountain of Uhud in gold as charity, it would not amount to a handful of what the Sahaba gave. Walla nasif, not even a half a handful of what they gave. And this is as it relates to the Sahaba, then how much more with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the sacrifices that he made for our ummah. Meanwhile, we still... 2020 still praising and extolling an individual from the 60s and 70s and and totally forgot about the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wallahi alazim i've heard people say in the past if it wasn't for Elijah Muhammad we wouldn't have Islam or if it wasn't for Warf Dean Muhammad you know we wouldn't have this you got to be kidding me this has to be a sick joke this has to be a joke if it wasn't for Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there would be no Elijah Muhammad. There would have been no Warf Deen Muhammad. There would have been no nation of Islam. There would have been nothing. And yet we jump right over that, skip right over that, and develop these unhealthy attachments to the personalities of individuals who on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not going to ask you anything about them. But he will ask you about one individual. Matter of fact, you will be asked about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in your grave. When you go to your grave and the angels come and they tell you to sit up and they ask you three questions. They're not going to ask you about Elijah Muhammad. They're not going to ask you about the nation of Islam. They're not going to ask you about Warf Deen, Imam Warf Deen. They're going to ask you about Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Ma taqulu fi alladhi ursila ilayk. What do you say about this man who was sent to you? Meaning Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did you respond to him? How did you respond to his message? Gotta be kid. This has to be a sick joke, man. Anyone who converts to Islam purely for the sake of Allah and begins reading the text, reading the scripts, and then you look out into the Muslim community, you're trying to say, how in the world did we drop the ball? It's very clear in the book. This book, very clear. It mentions nothing in this book about Elijah Muhammad. Nothing in this book about Warf Deen Muhammad. Nothing. This book was conveyed to us by one man. And one man only. And that was Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sacrifices that he made to make sure that we have this book. And we sit around praising individuals today. Who have done very little for the religion of Islam. In comparison to what the Sahaba did. Let alone much less the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This has to be a joke man. I have to be living in a, in a world that is parallel to, we have to be living in a world that is parallel to the world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to live in. This has to be a sick joke. Where did we drop the ball? Where did we lose sight of what was more important? And then we have to ask ourselves, as a Muslim ummah, as a community, as fragmented as we are, as dysfunctional as we are, could the fragmentation and the separation of the hearts and separations of the souls and the, 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 the dysfunction in our communities, could that all be as a result, as a consequence of our distance from the book of Allah, the distance from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Could this all be the consequence of our doing? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the truth. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Taraktukum ala mahajjit al-bayba, layluha ka nahariha, la yazigu anha illa harik. That I left you on a clear path. Its day is as clear as its night. No iwaj. There's no crookedness in the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That's why it's called Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight path. No crookedness in this path. How did we get diverted? How did we lose sight of what is important? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he will bring, he will bring, jitna min kulli ummatin bi shaheed. And how will it be when we bring forth every nation, a witness, a prophet for that nation? 
And we bring you, O Muhammad, as a witness against your ummah. This is a status. When the Prophet ﷺ told Abdullah bin Mas'ud, Iqra alayya al-Qur'an, read the Qur'an to me. And he started to recite Surah Al-Nisa. And he came across this ayah. The Prophet ﷺ told him, Qif, Qif, stop, stop. And when Abdullah bin Mas'ud looked up at the Prophet ﷺ, his whole face was wet with tears. Because this is a status that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give him. He's going to bring him as a witness over his entire nation. And he has to witness some of his nation. And unfortunately, as we'll see, some of us are not going to make it. And we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the Prophet ﷺ will try to intercede for some from his ummah. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inni furutakum ala al I will be the first one to get to the hawd, this river, that this water, body of water that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow the ummah of Muhammad to drink from. The Prophet sallallahu said, I will be the first one at the hawd drinking from the water. He said, وَمَنْ مَرَّ عَلَيَّ الشَّرِّبَ And whoever passes by me or gets to the water, they will also drink from it. وَمَنْ شَرِبَ لَمْ يَضْمَ أَبَدًا And whoever takes one sip from this river, this river that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alright? Al-wasila wal-fadila. This is what we recite after the adhan. We make the dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-wasila wal-fadila. Give him the wasila. This river that Allah promised him in paradise. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Everyone that passes by from my ummah will take a sip from this river. And when they take one sip, they will never be thirsty again. Can you imagine? Taking a sip from a river one time and you'll never be thirsty ever again. He said, um, He said, but there will be some people who will come to the river to drink and they will be chased away by the angels. They know me and I know them, meaning I know them from my ummah. I can see the prostration marks. I can see the traces of their iman. But they're being chased away from the river. And the Prophet وسلم, he will say, The Prophet وسلم, will tell the angels, They're from my ummah, they're from my ummah. Why are you chasing them away? And the angels will respond back to the Prophet وسلم, You don't know what they innovated, how they changed your religion after you. You don't know how they changed your religion after you. They're not a part of your ummah. Here again, these attachments, shakhsiyat, ta'abud the shakhsiyat, this personality worship that we do, innovating in the religion of the Prophet ﷺ, the angels will say, ma tadri ma ahdathu ba'dik. You don't know what they innovated, what they introduced into your religion after you. And the Prophet ﷺ will say, suhkan suhkan liman ghayyara wa liman badda'a ba'di. The Prophet ﷺ said, we'll take them away, away with the people who changed my religion after me. Some people are not going to make it. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are of those who sit from the hawl, sit from the lake or the river that is given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are amongst those who escape the anxiety and the fear and the trepidation and the worry that is associated with the hereafter. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum bima ja'a fihi min al-ayati wa dhikri al-hakim. Akulu ma tisma'oon. Astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'il al-mu'minin min kulli dham. Fastaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafuru rahim. Alhamdulillah al-Ali al-Jabbar. غافل الذنب وقابل التوب شديد الإقاب وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. Then Allah subhanahu wa taala goes on to say وسيق الذين كفروا إلى جهنم زمرة حتى إذا جاءوها فتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم رسل منكم يتلون عليكم آيات ربكم وينذرونكم لقاء يومكم هذا قالوا بلى ولكن حقت كلمة العذاب على الكافرين وقيل ادخلوا أبواب جهنم خالدين فيها فبت مثوى المتكبرين The angels will say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وسيق الذين كفروا And those who disbelieved live their lives a life of disbelief a life of refusal because disbelief is not just saying you don't believe in God 
This belief is acknowledging that God exists, but you refuse to obey him. You refuse to submit your life to him. Disbelief is not just a person who says, oh, uh, I don't believe in God. That's an atheist. A disbeliever, we're talking about a kafir, which is the root word of kafara, which means a person who is ungrateful. A person who is ungrateful. Because that's the origin of a person who refuses to acknowledge the right of God over him is that they are ungrateful. The origin of a person who refuses to worship Allah knowing that all of the gifts that Allah has given him has come from none other than him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet he still refuses to worship him. As Allah says in the Quran, يَعْرِفُونَ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ يُنْكِرُونَهَا بَلْ أَكْثَرُهُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ that they acknowledge the blessings of God on them, yet they refuse to acknowledge the right of Allah over them as it relates to those blessings. And most of them are sinful, rebellious individuals. But Allah says, وَالسِّيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ زُمَرَ And those who disbelieve will be ushered to the hellfire, Zumara. The, store, the name of the sore is called Zumar, which means a crowd, a group. That they will be ushered to the hellfire in groups. For those of you who like to be with the crowd, those of you who like to be with the group, those of you who don't like being an oddball, those of you who want to fit in, those of you who want to be with everybody else, you might want to be careful with that. You might want to be careful trying to be down with everybody else because as it seems, people will be ushered to the hellfire in groups. I'm not a crowd pleaser. I'm not one to be following the crowd. That's not my MO. And I would hope that it's not yours as well. Because as you can see, the group goes all together. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hatta idha ja'uha, when they get to the gate of the hellfire, the angels will address them. Qala lahum khazanatuha. The angel of at the gate of the hellfire, Malik, will address them. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him in the Quran, that the people in the hellfire, wanadaw ya Malik, and they will call out, Oh Malik. Call on your Lord to just destroy us. And Angel Malik is one is responsible for making sure that everyone that enters into the gate, the appropriate gate in the hellfire remains there. But when they get to the gate of the hellfire, the angel will ask them, Alam yatikum rusulun minkum. Didn't a messenger come to you from amongst yourselves? Meaning he spoke your language. There was no excuse there. He spoke your language. He was from you. Understood your culture. Didn't a messenger come to you from amongst yourselves? Reciting to you the ayats, the signs of your Lord, and warning you about this particular day? Didn't the, angel, uh, didn't the messenger come and warn you about this day? And what they will say is, Bella, of course he did. And the angels will say, then go ahead and enter into the hellfire because the punishment is justified against you. Enter into the hellfire to dwell therein forever. And these are the people who have been warned about this day for generations. And they always had an excuse, right? I have to live my life. I don't, I don't believe in God. I believe in God, but you know, I gotta, you know, I gotta do me. Or I gotta make more time for God. I gotta get right with God. I'm, I'm right with God, but I still drink. I still smoke. I still sleep around. I still do me, but I believe in God. You have those who walk around with a cross around their neck, but everything, their whole entire life is ungodly. What, what a shame, what a disrespect to your own religion to walk around with a cross around your neck, yet you drink, you smoke, you sex, you, you do everything under the sun, yet you, you hold on to the cross around your neck. It's just a relic. It has no meaning to it. It has no meaning to it. It's that you should be embarrassed to disrespect your religion. And likewise with Muslims, how you wear hijab, how you wear hijab and wear niqab, you lift your niqab up to smoke a cigarette. How you got on hijab and you smoke a blunt. How you put your kufi on and go into the masjid for Jumu'ah and then come out of the masjid, take your kufi off, go back on the block and sell drugs that's destroying people's lives. And then turn around and use as the excuse of why you're selling drugs because your home was dis uh, dis uh, dysfunctional, yet you making other people's homes dysfunctional. Generational dysfunctional, di dis generation, generational dysfunction that we are recycling, recycling pain in our community. You came from a broken home, broke down home, dysfunctional home, crack addict parents, drug addict parents, alcoholic parents, and yet you go back out on the streets and you selling drugs to other people's parents. What, what sense does that make? 
What sense does that make? Is it really worth it? You sell drugs to a pregnant woman and you use as the excuse if she ain't going to get it from me, she's going to get it from somebody else. So you just continue the cycle of pain. It's just mind-blowing. Mind-blowing how our communities have ended up the way that they ended up. But these were all of the excuses that we had. I don't believe in God and all of the other theories that we came up with that did not benefit us anything. And the gates of hell are seven. There's seven gates to the, to the hellfire. Everybody is not going to enter through the same exact gate going into the hellfire. All right. And each gate is an appropriate abode for those who spent an entire lifetime ignoring the inevitable. As Allah says in Surah to Naba, Jaza and Wifaqa, an appropriate punishment. Allah says in the Quran, in the Jahannam la Mawiduhum Ajma'in, indeed the hellfire is the meeting place for all of them. There are seven gates to the hellfire. Likulli Bab in Minhum Juzum Maksumun. That every gate, every gate from the gates of hellfire has a portion that is appropriate for the people that are in it. We seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the hellfire. The wrong that you've done, whether you uh, intended it or not, will wreak vengeance on your souls. The wrong that we have done, whether intentional or unintentional, it will wreak vengeance on our souls. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the believers. Almost done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ مِلَ الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرًا And those who feared Allah. Notice Allah said taqwa. He didn't say Muslims. He didn't say Muslims will be ushered to the gates of Jannah. Because unfortunately there's some who have to be punished, have to be purified first and have to taste the hellfire. And we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that. There are some Muslims that are going to hell. That's a fact. There are some Muslims who are going to burn in the hellfire first before they are allowed to enter into paradise. And that is as a purification for them because they escape the consequences of this life. Sometimes if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, that when Allah wants to do good to you, when Allah loves you, he punishes you in this life. So for those of us who have done wrong in our lives and we've gotten away with it, you didn't get away with anything. It's going to be waiting for you on the other side. You didn't get away with anything. You would want a lot to punish you here. You would want your punishment here so you don't have to face it in the hereafter. But there's some who escape the punishment in this life and it will be waiting for you on the other end. The Prophet ﷺ said, Tadruna mil muflis. Do you know who the bankrupt person is? A bankrupt someone who puts money in the bank and then goes to make a withdrawal and there's nothing there. Bankrupt, nothing there. Do you know who the bankrupt person is? The Sahaba said to the Prophet ﷺ, a person who has no money. The Prophet Sallallahu said, no, the bankrupt person is the person man salla wa sama wa jahada fi sabirillah, a person who fasted, person who prayed, person who fought in the cause of Allah, did all of these wonderful good deeds. He said, but in contrast to those good deeds, shatta mahada, he insulted this person. Wa dara and he, he hit this person. Wa safaka dam hada, and he spilled the blood of this person. Wa akhada mal hada, and he took the wealth of this, this person unjustly. Stole from this person, robbed this person, spilled this person's blood, talked about this person behind their back, violating people all over the place. But you got all these good deeds stored up for you. But in contrast to those good deeds, you have a whole bunch of violations. And those violations have to be rectified. So what will happen? The Prophet ﷺ said, This person will take from his good deeds. That person will take from his good deeds. That person will take from his good deeds. And he runs out of good deeds, but there's still people that he violated that he has to square away. You got to square those people away. But you don't have any more good deeds. So what happens? You take that person, you take their bad deeds. And then you'll be tossed into the hellfire. It's a Muslim. It's a Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ in this hadith is referring to a Muslim. Not referring to a non-Muslim. A Muslim. You're in the habit of backbiting. I hope you got a lot of good deeds stored up. Because when you backbite a person, all you're doing is giving them your good deeds on a platter. You talk about somebody behind their back. 
even if it's true. The Sahaba said, oh, Messenger of Allah, what if what we're saying about the person behind their back is actually the truth? Because that's the justification we use. Well, it's the truth. He is this or he is that. That's the truth. And we use that as a justification. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in that if what you are saying is not true, it's false, it's a lie, something you made up, قَدْ بَهَتَّهُ Then you have, uh, you have indeed insulted the person. But if what, you, uh, you, uh, if you, what you're saying is not true, then you have forged a lie on the person. You have slandered the person. And if what you're saying is true, then you have backbitten the person. And you have indeed backbiting. That is backbiting. Don't say, well, it's the truth. Refrain from mentioning people. Refrain from mentioning another Muslim's name out of your mouth. Unless you're strapped with a bunch of good deeds and you're willing to give that away on the day of judgment, it's totally up to you. Live your life. Live your life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a glimpse into the situation of those who made small sacrifices in the life of this world in order to reap the eternal benefits of the hereafter. After they pass across the bridge over the hellfire, they will come to the gates of Jannah. The last obstacle in the hereafter is to pass over the bridge over the hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِن مِّنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيَةً that there's none from amongst you except you got to cross the bridge. None from amongst you except you have to cross that bridge over the hellfire. This is something that has already been decreed. None from amongst you except that you have to cross over this bridge. Once they make it over the bridge, those of the believers who make it over the bridge, they will come to the gate of Jannah. And guess who will be at the, 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 at the head of the gate, at the front gate waiting before all of the believers get there? None other than Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in an authentic hadith, Ata al-bab al-jannah, yawm al-qiyamah, fa-astaftih, fa-yakulu al-khazin, man anta, fa-akulu Muhammad, fa-yakulu bal umirtu an la aftah li ahadin qablik. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I will come to the gate of jannah. I want you to imagine this. Picture this. With everything that you know from the Quran and the Sunnah of the descriptions of paradise. The Quran is the most descriptive book in terms of describing the paradise and the hellfire. I want you to imagine that moment when you show up across the bridge and you show up at the gate of Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ is standing there waiting for the gate to open. The Prophet ﷺ said that I will be the first one. For ana awwalu man yaqra al bab. I will be the first one to knock on the gate of Jannah. And then the Khazan al Jannah, whose name the gatekeeper of paradise, whose name is Ridwan, will come to the gate of Jannah and ask, "Who are you?" And the Prophet ﷺ will say, with so much honor. After all the sacrifices he made in this life, he gets to say his name at the gate of Jannah, the first person. Can you imagine the honor? And this is why I make it a point no matter where I go when a person says, well, what's your name? Muhammad. You want that name to be known. I go in Starbucks. I order coffee. They ask, what's the name for the cup? Muhammad. Because I want that name to be known everywhere. Not to mention that it's the most popular name in the world. It is the most popular name in the world for those of our Muslim brothers who are ashamed of Muhammad and they call themselves Mo or Mu. My name is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He knocks on the gate. The gatekeeper of Jannah opens the gate and says, "Who are you, Mananta?" And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Muhammad." And the angel says, "I know that that's your name." I have been commanded not to open this gate for anyone before you. None from amongst your ummah, with the exception of the shuhada who are already in paradise, but none from amongst your ummah will be allowed to enter into paradise before you. Similar to Uthman when they went to the peace treaty of Hudaybiyah and they went to Mecca to perform Umrah and the Prophet sallallahu sent Uthman as an emissary to go talk to Quraysh while they waited on the outskirts of Mecca in a place called Hudaybiyah. And the Quraysh, they were so fond of Uthman, they told Uthman, if you want to make Umrah, you want to go around the Kaaba and make Tawaf, you can go. And Uthman said, Wallahi, I will never make Tawaf around the Kaaba before the Prophet ﷺ, ever. Abedin. 
I will never make tawaf around the Kaaba before the Prophet Sallallahu The angel says the same thing. I was commanded not to open the door of Jannah for anyone before you. And the honor that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave him for the sacrifices that he made, not just for our ummah, but for the entire world. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the greatest humanitarian ever to step foot on this earth. He was a humanitarian, the meaning of the word humanitarian. And some of us are in a place of privilege where people praise us and thank us, but at the gates of Jannah, the Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, it will come to the gates of Jannah. And the angel will say, Salamun alaykum tibitum fadkhuluha khalidin. Peace be upon you. You did good in the life of this world. Tell me there's not a man from amongst us, a woman from amongst us who likes to hear you did a good job. <coughs> Those words, tibitum, you did good. Fadkhuluha khalidin. And they will enter into paradise to dwell therein forever. لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ No fear upon them, no shall, nor shall they grieve. No where they will مَاهُمْ مِنْهَا بِمُخْرَجِينَ Nor will they be asked to leave. And they will enter into Jannah. And every step that they take in paradise, they will smell the fragrance of musk coming from the ground. When they think about something, a food that they want, it will come to them. And subhanAllah, modern technology has shown us that that is actually possible. Because right now in a conversation on your cell phone, on your, uh, on your iPhone, right now, if you have a conversation with somebody about a, a particular food or a particular restaurant, what happens when you open up your phone? There's an ad right there on your phone advertising the same food that you thought about. That shows us that that is possible. Because the technology that is afforded us in this day and time is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unlocking another level of knowledge for human beings in our lifetime. It's all from God. It's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What makes it demonic is what we decide to do with it. We're recreating, we're splitting genes, sharing DNA and putting this to that. That's of course from shaitan. But the technology itself is from God. It's knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us access to that we didn't have access to before. And so today, you can have a conversation with somebody about food, a particular restaurant, and you open up your smartphone and there's ads, advertisements for restaurants that you talked about that you didn't even search for. This is artificial intelligence that is giving you restaurants that are similar to the foods that you were just having a conversation about. So just imagine in Jannah, you think about a particular food and the food comes to you. This is the paradise and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ending the ayah of he said, وَتَرَى الْمَلَائِكَةُ حَافِينَ مِنْ حَوْلِ الْعَرْشِ يُسَبِّحُونَ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّهِ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّهِمْ وَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and when they enter into Jannah, they will see, وَتَرَى الْمَلَائِكَةُ حَافِينَ مِنْ حَوْلِ الْعَرْشِ They will enter into paradise and see the angels flying around the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يُسَبِّحُونَ بِرَبِّهِمْ They will be praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ And they will have earned that Jannah. وَقِيلَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And their last words as they enter into paradise will be الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ All praises due to Allah, Rabbul <laughs> Alameen. Allah's promise was true. They will realize at that moment when they enter into Jannah and they see everything around them, they will realize that Allah's promise was true. Allah promised me Jannah that if I made small sacrifices here in this life, small sacrifices, getting up in the morning for Fajr, pray two raka'ah, which takes a total of five minutes. That's a small sacrifice. Fasting in the month of Ramadan, when you get to eat in the, at the end of the day and at the beginning of the day, you're only not eating lunch. It's a small sacrifice. Small sacrifice. And they will say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praises due to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. His promise was true. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Jannah. Oh Allah, we ask you for Jannah to the al A'la. Oh Allah, we ask you for the highest place in Jannah. Oh Allah, we ask you for your forgiveness during this blessed month of Ramadan. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salama tasliman kathira. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa aqimu salat.